All right, so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be looking at the growth of representative government in the 13 colonies. So if you guys remember back to yesterday, we kind of looked at how these were the roots of representative government. So kind of like how did government develop in these 13 colonies? So remember that we were looking at a very the very beginning of it. We were looking at the early 1600s when we start to have colonies develop here in the United States. Sorry, I guess that was, I was recording on the wrong one. Okay, here, let me start over. Okay, I turned on my microphone on the correct side this time. All right, so remember yesterday, we started talking about the roots of representative government. So when I say the roots of something, really what I'm talking about is like the foundation of it. How did it begin? And when we looked at the colonies in the early 1600s, we really saw the development of these this like idea of representative government start to develop. And people like William Penn and other colonial leaders start to make this part of their own government in the colonies. And there are a couple of things that are leading to this. We have some people who have religious ideals that are founded on some level of democracy. And this is in particular, we can see this in the Quakers. And we also just have a lot of neglect by the English king. And the English king for the most part just left the colonies to govern themselves. And kind of in this absence of power, in this power vacuum, we will really start to see government develop in the 13 colonies. And that's kind of what we're going to look at today. So yesterday we kind of looked at the roots of colonial government in the early 1600s, also in like English law itself in things like the Magna Carta and other parts of English law. And so today we're really going to look at the growth of government in the colonies. So how did this idea of self-government or representative government really take hold and become popular within the colonies, okay? So that's what we're gonna be looking at today. We do have a pretty big assignment today. Um, you can see that this is definitely a block day assignment. So there are a couple of things that we'll go through. The first thing you can see, there's a video up here. We're gonna watch that as a class in just a second. Um, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to respond to a discussion question. So if you go ahead and click on that link, it's going to bring you over to the discussion question, which asks you, what does it mean to represent someone? Why would a person need someone to represent them? Share examples of when in your lives you might be asked or might choose to represent someone. Your answer should be at least four sentences and answer both parts of the question. Okay, so make sure that you are following the requirements if you want to have a good grade on this. All right, so after you've done the discussion post, you're going to go ahead and start with analyzing some documents. So what we're going to do here is you're going to read these documents and then hopefully you're going to develop an idea of what representation in the columns looked like. And you're going to be looking for evidence of how these documents would allow laws or rules to be enacted. Okay, so let's go ahead and click on this document and we'll take a look at it, or this hyperlink, and take a look at the documents. So as you read through it, you're gonna answer the questions underneath. Make sure you include text evidence where speci specified. This will help you later in your writing assessment. So this is a very important piece, right? I, a lot of people have lost points on our previous writings because they're not using text evidence. So when I say that you need to include text evidence, what I'm meaning is that you need to read it and then take specific parts out of the story or out of the document and then use that when you're writing. Okay, so um, we can go over that when we do it, but that is important. You need to make sure that you're including the text documents. So you're going to go ahead and make a copy. All right, and then if we take a look at this, we can see that there are some important documents in here. So we have the Virginia House of Burgesses, and then we've got six questions on it. So we're gonna to need to answer those six questions. We have the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. And again, there are four more questions, or four questions, or six more questions. We have the Mayflower Compact. And again, this time seven questions. So you're going to need to answer all of those questions after you read the document. And again, make sure that you're using evidence from the text to support your conclusions. So that means that you can be pulling quotes 
or referencing specifics in your reading when you are answering the questions, okay? All right, after you have read the documents, we're gonna come down to part three, which is writing a thesis statement. So this is an important part of history. Remember, we are gonna spend a lot of time this year practicing writing thesis statements. A thesis statement is A thesis statement is when we use um, like evidence or we come up with a conclusion. It's kind of like writing an essay in English. When we come up with a conclusion and then we support that conclusion with evidence. So like I could say, Mr. Swoblin's class has a lot of YouTube videos. And then I would point to the fact that there's a YouTube video for pretty much every assignment, right? Something like that. So where are you coming up with a piece of specifics, so something you believe in or argument, and then you're supporting it with evidence from the text. All right, so after answering the questions, use this graphic organizer to prepare a thesis statement and find text evidence to support it, okay? So when you open that, you're gonna come up with this graphic organizer, and we're gonna use this to kind of structure our thesis statement, okay? You can see it's not super long, but it's gonna ask you to come up with your thesis. So they say controlling idea or your main argument, your big idea, it's gonna go up in here. And then you're gonna come up with three pieces of evidence. And they've actually laid out this three, these three for you, right? In those documents that you already read. So if you do a good job when you're doing the text analysis and you're using textual evidence, then this part is gonna be a lot easier for you. Okay, so after you, fill out your graphic organizer. It says, if you need additional support in writing a thesis statement, here's a good resource. It's just a website. You will be turning the Teacher, graphic organizer. every time sixth grade students, the first group needs to report to the cafeteria. Thank you. You will be turning the graphic organizer into this assignment for feedback on your thesis statement. There's a rubric in there if you want to look at some specifics on how the thesis statement will be graded, um, but just your thesis statement is going to end up being graded for this. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and we're going to start this together. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and watch the video first, and then we will go from there. In this video, History Illustrated is going to take a look at this phrase representative government. Now, I talked recently about the idea of self-government, and if you haven't watched that video yet, please go take a look at it just so that you can have an understanding of what this word government really means. I, I focused on it quite heavily so that you can understand what they do, and what government means. In this video, though, I want you to take a look at this particular part of the word representative. Represent. I'm going to write that down here. Represent. Now, many people have an idea of what the word represent means. I'm going to go ahead and talk to you about it anyway, just to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, for example, I want to just go ahead and draw something here, a little symbol here. Many of you might have seen that. You might say, oh, yeah, I know what that is. That is the peace symbol. It means peace. Now, this symbol, the peace symbol, it's basically a placeholder, a placeholder. It doesn't mean peace. It's just a symbol we draw to represent peace. So a placeholder is something that represents the actual meaning. The, the idea of drawing peace would be pretty complicated. So we just draw a simple symbol to represent it or to hold its place, to stand in place of something else. This idea will help you out in understanding what representative government means. So let's take a look at this particular group of people here, this one here. And let's just say, for example, that this is a state somewhere inside the United States. It doesn't matter which one. And let's just say for the sake of argument that all of these are different states. Now, like I said in the last video, we talked about self-government. What that essentially means is that these people in this state, they would practice self government, which means they run themselves. They make their own rules. They govern themselves. And this would be true for all of these individual states. They would all make their own rules and govern themselves. 
but they would also be a part of a bigger group. All of them together would be a part of a country, and they would have to make rules for all of the groups of people to abide by as well. And the way they would do this with the idea of representative government would be that this group of people would vote for a particular, for a particular person. Let's say, for example, they voted on this guy here. They said, hey, you need to go to the Capitol. Let's say this is the Capitol here in this group, and you need to vote for laws that would benefit us so that we would approve of. We want you to go to the Capitol to vote for us to make sure that they don't make a law that really doesn't help us out at all. And then each group, every single one of them would do the exact same thing. They would all send their own little representative to go vote for them. And then they would all vote together in the Capitol to make laws for the entire group, all of these groups together. I think that explains the idea of representative government pretty well. Just remember that each group votes for a person to represent that entire group. They will then go vote for that group. Okay, so representative government. All right. So remember, representative government is just this idea that our government represents the people. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the discussion post, okay? So you guys can go ahead and get started with this. Oh, the reel is already in there. What does it mean to represent someone? Why would a person need someone to represent them? Share examples of when in your lives you might be asked or might choose to represent someone. Your answer should be at least four sentences and answer both parts of the question. Okay, so let's think about the word represent for a second, right? When I say the word represent, it kind of means that somebody is standing in my place, that they are there with my ideas or supporting what I believe in, right? So, you know, you might have a parent-teacher conference or something, and your parents are going to represent your interests, right? They're not you, but they're there looking out for your best interests, Okay, so let's go ahead and we're going to take five minutes. You guys can go ahead and complete the dis discussion post. Remember, you need to get four sentences in. Okay, so go ahead and we're going to spend five minutes doing this and then we'll come back and we will start on the next part together. All right, so we did five minutes on there. It looks like we've got some in here. Refresh, hopefully there's more. Okay, so everybody needs to be responding to this discussion post. So it looks like we're still missing a couple of people. So let's give us one more minute and we'll get those turned in, okay? So remember, you guys need to be participating in all parts of today's assignment. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look. Hopefully we got some more in here. There's a few more in here, so please make sure that if you've not turned yours in, that you're turning in your assignments. All right, so let's go ahead and we're gonna go back to our main assignment and let's take a look at the next part. Okay, so if we're gonna come, we're gonna go to part two now, analyzing the documents. So the first thing that we're gonna need to do is you guys are gonna need to open this read of documents. So go ahead and click on this going to ask you to make a copy, so please make sure that you put your first and last name in there, and we're also going to all share the sharing, change the sharing settings today. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put mine in as Mark Swoblin. Okay, and then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here and I'm going to change the sharing settings so that anyone with the link can view. Okay, so we're going to change this from restricted. And we're going to change it to anyone with the link. All right, I'm gonna give everybody about 30 seconds. We can get caught up with me and then we'll get started today. All right, so one more time, remember what you did is you put your name into the document. So I put my name in here. And we're also gonna come up, we're gonna click sharing settings, and we're gonna change this so that anyone with the link can view, okay? So you're gonna change that and click done. 
That way, when you, um, when you turn this in, I can see it. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Virginia House of Burgesses. Remember that Virginia House of Burgesses is one of our early forms of representative government in the United States. The royal governor, George Yeardley, arrived in Virginia in April 1619 and announced that the Virginia Company had decided to create a legislative assembly, which became the House of Burgesses. It met for the first time in July 1619 at Jamestown Church. In addition to Governor Yardley, 22 Burgesses, or elected representatives, representing 11 settlements were present. Only Anglo males, so that means white men, who owned a certain amount of property were eligible to vote for the Burgesses. The House of Burgesses was to meet at least once a year to make local laws and determine local taxes. It was the first popularly elected legislature in what later became part of the United States. Its first business, apparently, was to set a minimum price for selling tobacco. John Pory, Secretary Governor, Yardley's Council, recorded the proceedings of the first meeting of the House of Burgesses. Corey's records are today part of the Library of Congress, Thomas Jefferson's collection. Through the years of its existence, the House of Burgesses had many famous members, including George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Patrick Henry. The creation of the House of Burgesses was, was a significant event in the development of what became the United States as each new English colony demanded its own legislature. By the time the English colonies declared their independence from England in 1776, citizens had 157 years of experience with democracy. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look back at our um, questions and then we're gonna try and answer it with our reading. So remember, the point of this is that we're gonna try and use text evidence in our answers. So we're gonna try and find specifics in the reading that we can use to support our answers. All right, so the first question is, what year did this begin? And that's pretty easy for us, right? It says, it met for the first time in July 1619 at Jamestown Church. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert part of the quote here, but only a little piece of it. So the rest, I'm going to keep it um, just my own writing, okay? And you guys can feel free to just write down what I'm doing. So I'm going to say, in 1619, Governor George Beardley and the Virginia Company created the House of Burgesses which met for the, I'm gonna say, and then I'm gonna put this into quotes and I'm just gonna take it straight out of here, which met for the quote, first time in July 1619 at Jamestown Church. Okay, so if you look at what I did, right, we went up here. I've taken just a very small piece of the quotation. It's just a small quote, right? Your quotes do not need to be very long. And I've gone and I've put it into my answer, okay? And most of the answer I wrote, but what I did is I put a little piece of text evidence in there. And you can do this with pretty much any question. And the more you do this, the more you're using evidence to support your thesis. So the stronger your argument or presentation will be. All right, so what year did this begin? So what I said is in 1619, Governor George Yeardley and the Virginia Company created the House of Burgesses, which met for the first time in July 1619 at Jamestown Church, okay? Let me give everybody a second. You guys can go ahead and write that one down. And then we'll, let's go, we'll go on to our next question.
All right. What is a Burgess's and what qualified what qualifications were required to fulfill this duty? All right, so let's go ahead and look back up here. So it says, in addition to Governor Yearly, 22 Burgesses or elected representatives representing 11 settlements were present. Only Anglo males who owned a certain amount of property were eligible to vote for the Burgesses. The House of Burgesses was to meet at least once a year to make local laws and determine local taxes. Okay, so let's go ahead and this is all important stuff. Oops. This is all important stuff for us, all right? So let's go ahead and highlight that. So in addition to Governor Yearly, 22 Burgesses, and Burgesses just mean elected representatives, so people who are elected by the towns to go and represent them, representing 11 settlements were present. Only Anglo males, and remember Anglo just means white man, who owned a certain amount of property were eligible to vote for the Burgesses. The House of Burgesses was to meet at least once a year to make local laws and determine taxes. Okay, so let's go. What is a Burgesses and what qualifications were required to fulfill this duty? All right, so we know that a Burgess was an elected representative from the 11 towns or 11 settlements near Jamestown and under the authority of the Virginia Company, right? Because these are towns that are representing the Virginia Company. So I said a Burgess was an elected representative from the 11 settlements near Jamestown and under the authority of the Virginia Company. You know what, I'm just going to take out that second part. Let's just put 11 settlements near Jamestown. All right, what qualifications were required to fulfill this duty? Okay, so I'm going to say the Burgesses were required to be, and then let's go ahead and put a quote in here so that we can use a little bit more text evidence. The quote would be only Anglo males who owned a certain amount of property were eligible to vote in the Burgesses. So I'm going to put, were required to be Anglo males who owned a certain amount of property. Okay, so we've got, now we've got our second quote in here. You guys can go ahead and write this one down. So a Burgess is an elected representative from the 11 settlements near Jamestown. The Burgesses were required to be, quote, Anglo males who owned a certain amount of property. All right, so I'm going to give everybody uh, about 30 seconds to get this right up, and then we're going to move on, and we're going to go a little bit more quickly for the next couple of questions. All right, provide evidence that it was a representative government. Okay, now remember a representative government is saying that these people are like standing in place for their towns, right? And that's pretty much what it specifically said. In addition to Governor Yearly, 22 Burgesses, elected representatives representing 11 settlements were present. Okay, so I'm, let's put um, the 22 Burgesses were elected representatives from the settlements um, in Virginia, okay? And it's gonna ask us what power did it have? So we can go back and look at this again. 
So it says the House of Burgesses was to meet at least once a year to make local laws and determine the taxes. So we can go ahead and just put this whole thing in there as our quote, right? Because this is like our exact answer. So I'm just going to insert an entire quote in here. And if you guys haven't done this before, you can hit Control C and Control V. Oops. More right click. All right, so I said the House of Burgesses was to meet at least once a year and make local laws and determine taxes. And this is just directly out of the statement, okay? All right, so we've got two things. You guys can go ahead and get those written up, them down, and then we'll move on. So it says provide evidence that it was a representative government. And I said 22 Burgesses were elected representatives from the settlements in Virginia. What power did it have? Quote, the House of Burgesses was to meet at least once a year to make local laws and determine taxes. All right, provide evidence how religion played a role in this colony. Okay, so let's go back up here and more look around. I don't see any evidence in here, so I don't know why there's no physical. So I'm just going to say there is no evidence of religion in the text. But we know that members of the House of Burgesses had to be part of the Indian country. And you guys can just put that in there because I don't see any evidence in the text. So I said there is no evidence of religion in the text, but we know that members of the House of Burgesses had to be part of the Anglican Church. All right, why was it significant? Okay, so we know that I saw this in the last line there. It says, or the last second of last line, the creation of the House of Burgesses was significant, was a significant event in the development of what became the United States as each new colony demanded its own legislature. Okay, so I'm going to put the House of Burgesses, but it's important because I'm going to put another quote in here. I'm going to put quote, demanded its own legislature after the example set in Virginia. And so I said the House of Burgesses was important because each new colony, quote, demanded its own legislature after the example set in Virginia. And you can see here again, right, I'm just inserting a small piece of the quote into my sentence. So my whole sentence is not the quote, it's I'm just taking a specific piece of it. And that is really the best way for you to use text evidence when you're doing these um, thesis writing. So when you're doing writing in history. All right, so let's keep going. The fundamental orders of Connecticut. Great Britain does not have a written constitution similar to that of the United States. The British Constitution is composed of customs, traditions, and important documents such as the Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights. Some of the Englishmen who settled in the American colonies, including the men who founded the Connecticut colony in 1636, did not have much faith in this approach to government. Unpleasant memories of recent authoritarian acts by England's rulers prompted the Connecticut settlers to put their own plan of government into writing. The Fundamental Orders of Connecticut was the first written constitution on the soil of North America. It set up a government for the Connecticut colony. 
This document was a step in the direction of present day democracy in, in that it set the example of a written constitution as the basis of government. Okay, so what's important here that they're talking about is that there's no real constitution in England, right? They have the Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights, but in the United States, everything that we do as far as government is codified. So we have a very clear understanding of what our government does. But England doesn't have that. So one of the things that people coming over from England to the US, to these original 13 colonies want, is they want clear structured government. And that's really gonna be the birth of the constitution. We're gonna see that come out of the desire that people have for clear, consistent government. All right, January 14th, 1639. And this is from the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. We, the inhabitants and residents of Windsor, Hartford and Weathersfield, knowing where our people are gathered together, the word of God requires that to maintain the peace in union of such people. You are asking to only be Can you guys please make sure that you're muted? Uh, of such a people there should only there should be an orderly and decent government established, and therefore associate ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth and do for ourselves and our successors enter into combination and confederation, which means union, together, and also in our civil affairs to be guided and governed according to such laws, rules, orders, and decrees as shall be made, ordered, and decreed as Mr. Follows. Stroland, you're on mute. I'm on mute? Nope. Oh. How'd that happen? Okay, oh, I muted myself. Okay, so, sorry. Therefore, associate ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth, and do for ourselves and our successors into com enter into combination and confederation or union together, and also in our civil affairs to be guided and governed according to such laws, rules, orders, and decrees as shall be made, ordered, and decreed as follows. Whew, that's confusing. It is ordered that there shall be a yearly two general assemblies or courts, so they're going to have called government twice a year. It is ordered that no person sh be chosen governor above more than once in two years and that the governor be always a member of some approved congregation. So this is saying that the governor has to be part of a church and he can't do it for more than two years. He can't be governor for more than two years. It is ordered that the constable of each town shall forthwith give notice distinctly to the inhabitants of the same that at a place and time by him or their then limited and set, they meet and assemble to elect and choose certain deputies to be at the general court then following to agitate, discuss in public the affairs of the Commonwealth. So the constable is going to call everybody to come and do this together. So he's gonna call everybody out to have a meeting. It is ordered that every general court shall consist of the governor or someone chosen to moderate, preside over the court and four other magistrates, at least, with the major part of the deputies of several towns legally chosen. Okay, so this is taken from the Living Documents by Star Todd. All right, so what year was the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut written? Sixteen thirty-nine. Okay, so let's go ahead and write that down. Why did they write this document? Okay, so remember we talked about how there is no written constitution in English, so England. So let's kind of use, let's see if we can find a quote. Oh, here's a perfect one. Unpleasant memories of recent authoritarian acts. So that means that the government is doing things that people don't like. All right, so I'm gonna put this down here and then let's see how we can fit it in. The settlers in Connecticut chose to write down their governing laws because they had, quote, unpleasant memories of recent authoritarian acts in England. England did not have England did not have a written constitution 
which meant that laws were not always followed. All right, so why did they write this document? What I said, the settlers in Connecticut chose to write down their governing laws because they had, quote, unpleasant memories of recent authoritarian acts in England, and England did not have a written constitution, which meant that laws were not always followed. Okay, so you can go ahead and write that one down. Okay, provide evidence that it was a representative government. All right, so let's see. It, so this right here is like quotes from the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. So let's see where it says that it's representative. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and we can use this. So it says to elect and choose certain deputies to be at the general court. Okay, so it's ordered that the constable, so the constable is in charge. So this, I'm gonna use this as part of our quote then, okay? So I'm gonna say the constables of each town was charged with, so that means he's ordered to do something charged with quote, charged, or I'll say charged to elect and choose deputies to be at the general court, okay? And this is showing us that these are elected representatives. So provide evidence that it was a representative government. So what I said is the constables of each town were charged to elect and choose certain deputies to be at the general court. All right, so I'll give everybody a second or two. You can get that one put up. All right, what power did it have? So what power did it have? Let's see if we can find it in modern English. Okay, so here we go. So. This is where it's talking about some of the powers that they have. So it says that this governing body can enter into combination and confederation together so they can come together and also in our civil affairs to be guided and governed according to such laws, rules, and orders and decrees shall be made, ordered, and decreed as followed. So they have the power to create laws, rules, orders, and decrees. Okay, so let's go ahead and put that in there. Let's say the fundamental orders of Connecticut gave power to so I'm gonna say the power to create laws, rules, orders, and decrees that govern towns within the colony. Okay. So I said it, the fundamental orders of Connecticut gave the power to create laws, rules, orders, and decrees that govern the towns within the colony. All right, let's look at our second two more and then we'll take a quick break because this is a lot of reading. So we'll take a break in just a second and you guys can go to the bathroom. All right, provide evidence of how religion played a role in this community. All 
right. Okay, so here we go. The governor always to be a member of an approved congregation, okay? So there's some evidence of religion, okay? So I'm gonna say the fundamental orders of Connecticut required the governor to be So I'm going to say required the governor to be a member of some approved congregation. And that means that he has to be part of a church. A congregation is a church group. Why was this document significant? Okay, so say this document was significant because it was the first time in the colonies we wrote down our laws similar to a constitution, okay? So this is really the first set of codified laws. So the first time that we are bringing all of our laws together and writing them down into something like a constitution. All right, so I'm gonna give you guys five minutes. We'll have a quick break if you need to go to the bathroom. Um, so five minutes and then we'll jump back on and we'll keep going because we still have a bit to go, okay? Okay, so the last one is the Mayflower Compact. So everybody should be back with me now. Let's go ahead and get this one done. On November 11th, 1620, the storm-battered vessel bearing the pilgrims to the lonely shores of the New World sailed in from the open sea and dropped anchor in the chill waters of what is now Provincetown Harbor. The Mayflower was far off its course, and the pilgrims had no legal right to settle in New England or to establish a government. But they had no choice, for winter was close at hand, and the colony had to be started. Confronted by the need for action, the pilgrim leaders drafted the Mayflower Compact. Later, the men gathered in the cabin of the ship and signed their names to the document. The Mayflower Compact became an important landmark along the road leading to democracy. It did not outline a plan of government, but, and this is a significant point, the compact did commit the pilgrims to the creation of a government based on the consent of the governed. Okay, so we know that this is um, the really important thing that they're talking about is the compact did commit the pilgrims to the creation of a government based on the consent of the government. So it means that they are going to create a government that is based on the desire of the people. November 11th, 1620. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread, revered and feared sovereign, Lord King James, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith, in honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents, this document, solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and of one another, promise and combine ourselves together into a civil body group or organized for government for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact such just and equal laws from time to time as shall be thought the most fitting and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness thereof, we have hereunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th of November, in the year of our reign of our sovereign, King Lord King James of England, 1620. All right, so we know real right off the bat, we can say the Mayflower Compact was written in 1620. Why did they write this document? All right, so here we can go back and use um, this quote, right? So it says that they are like all of a sudden they're having to land in the New World in Provincetown Harbor. Um, they had no legal right to settle in New England or to establish a government, but they had no choice, okay? So let's say, um, so let's say, the pilgrims were forced to land in New England, even though they weren't allowed to. The Mayflower Compact was written because the settlers 
wanted to create a government who ruled with the consent of the government. Okay. So I know it's a little bit complicated, so let's break it down real quick. So what I wrote is um, the pilgrims were forced to land in New England, even though they weren't allowed to, right? Because it said that they weren't supposed to land there. They didn't have a charter from the king. It says the Mayflower Compact was written because the settlers wanted to create a government who ruled with the consent of the governed. So that last, last little part is really important, right? This idea of a representative government is based on creating a community or that has a government who rules with the consent of the government so govern so that's saying that all of these people in the mayflower compact got together and they agreed that they were going to create a government which was based on their own wishes okay and that's really important in this beginning of american um, representative government all right so you guys can go ahead and write this one down you get two to write down and then we will get going to the next one. So please make sure that you're writing these down as we go along. All right, what is a civil body politic? Okay, so um, let's see what they defined it as. A group organized for government. All right, so let's just use their quote. So I'm going to say a quote group organized for government. Um, one thing, too, if you guys are going to see in these, when you read these types of like really complicated history readings, when you see them put like things in these special types of parentheses here, this means that someone at a later time went and added that in so that we know what they're saying. Because as you can see, all of this stuff is written in a really hard to understand way. So people would go back in and add, they add the stuff in the parentheses. That's why they're in parentheses. All right, provide evidence that it was a representative government. Okay. All right, let's see what it says. So they're going to combine ourselves into a civil body politic. Okay, so this really right here is going to be our definition of creating a representative government because they're saying that they are going to create a group of themselves that will be governed, right? We just said it's a group organized for government, and those are the citizens themselves. So I'm going to say the Mayflower Compact says its settlers will combine ourselves into a civil body politic to create laws for the colony. All right, so the Mayflower Compact says its settlers will, quote, combine ourselves together into a city body, body politic to create laws for the colony. So there again, we're embedding a quote into our um, answer and that's the best way to really use text evidence to support yourself all right what power did it have here what power did it have So it doesn't really outline very much power. What it really is talking about is that the people are going to be represented, represented in there. Um, yeah, it doesn't really say. So let's answer it this way. I'm going to say the Mayflower Compact does not give specific powers to the legislature but instead says that the government will represent the people of the colony, okay? So I said the Mayflower Compact does not give specific powers to the legislature, but instead, instead says that it will, the government will represent the people of the colony. All right, so I know I just went through those ones real quick. I'll give you guys a second or two to get caught up with me.
All right. So provide evidence of how religion played a role in this colony. Okay, so let's go back. And this whole thing is like really about religion, right? In the first sentence, says, it says, in the name of God, amen. So we can definitely use that. Um, we do these present solemnly, mutually, and in the presence of God. So I'm gonna, let's just, we can do this simple one. Let's just start off with what it says. I'm going to say the first sentence of the Mayflower Compact shows the settlers were taking this document based on their religion. I'm going to say the first sentence says, and I'll just go ahead and put the quote in here. In the name of God, amen. Right, And pretty much the whole rest of that quote of the excerpt from the text is referencing God. So we can, that should give us enough evidence of what we're talking about. All right, why was it significant? All right, awesome. We already have like the perfect quote for this one outlined. So we can come up here and we're going to go, it says the compact did commit. It says the, May, the compact did commit the pilgrims to the creation of a government based on the consent of the government. All right, and we can just pretty much use this um, in here. So what I'm gonna say is, All right, so what I said is the Mayflower Compact was important because it said representative government was important to the colony. Specifically, it said, quote, the compact did commit the pilgrims to the creation of a government based on the consent of the government. All right, so you guys can get that one caught up. Brinley, you need to figure out a way to stay awake in class. I'm sending an email to your parents right now, okay? So we're not gonna keep doing this. So I would figure out a way to sit up. Maybe you need to move around, but you can't be sleeping in class. All right. So hopefully everybody has got us um, caught up with where we're at. Let's go back and let's take a look at um, what we've got. All right, so part three is writing a thesis statement. So I think that we're gonna have to save this for um, Friday. So we're not gonna try and worry about that today. Um, we do have quite a bit of stuff that we went over today. So hopefully everybody has got this all cut up. Like I mentioned before, we I'm gonna go ahead and um, put this up into the Canvas assignment later today. So you guys can go ahead and use that. But we'll, we'll finish the rest of this stuff in class on Friday, okay? So we'll work on it together because it, it is pretty challenging. All right, so it looks like we're about 12 minutes early. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of free time today. You guys can go ahead and log off 10 minutes early. Please make sure that you've got this whole part that you're caught up to where we're at, okay? And I will see you on Friday. Have a great day.